Hi, this is Russ Anderson. In this tutorial, I'm going to introduce some cool new features in Synthize called Geometric Hierarchy Tracking. Now, Geometric Hierarchy Tracking has three main elements. The first one is Geometry Tracking. And this is a shot from a different tutorial. And you'll see that there aren't any conventional supervised or automatically generated trackers. Instead, the geometry itself has been tracked. So that's the first element. The second element is deformation. There's only one pizza box in the scene, and it's being deformed continually to match up with what happened in the original shot. And at the end of the process, we can export that animated deformation to other applications. So deformation is the second main element. The third main element is hierarchy. And you see up in the hierarchy view that there are three different elements. There's a base object. There's a secondary object, the child object, that's for the side panel of the pizza box, which moves independently. And the third object there is for the top of the box. So all three of them are being animated to produce the desired motion. And for these secondary objects, only specific degrees of freedom are being tracked and the other ones are being maintained. So the, the relationship between the different elements is maintained at all times. So those are the three main elements of geometric hierarchy tracking. Some basic geometry tracking, deformation, and hierarchy. Now one of the cool things about it is that it also works with supervised trackers. So you can use them for very difficult to track situations to achieve precise control over whatever it is that you need to do. And it gives you some additional very flexible capabilities as well. So in this particular tutorial, we're going to be showing an example that has some geometric hierarchy tracking layered on top of an existing moving object solve from the regular Synthize solver. So this is kind of an introductory meta tutorial. There are a whole bunch of follow-on tutorials for you to watch after this. And oh, there's a whole new manual on geometric hierarchy tracking, which you can find up on the help menu. So we're going to work with this head tracking shot here. It's something you can see that I've done some supervised tracking on already. Just a quick little look at it. We've got some little purple dots. And to do that, I use spot trackers with the green channel, which gives good contrast for those purple dots. So I, you know, I just worked through and did the supervised tracking for these. So we've got a whole bunch of supervised trackers sitting on the camera. So we're going to start out changing this into a moving object track. So I created my moving object there. And I'm going to shift, click that little green swatch to select that whole group of trackers and move them down to the moving object. Now, the ones that I selected are ones that are rigid, pretty much, with respect to one another. And that's one of the requirements for doing moving object trackers, that the trackers can't move around in 3D with respect to one another. So I just sorted through these to, to get those that stayed relatively fixed locations, not the ones around the mouth that are moving around, for example. So at this point, we could nearly do this all. We needed to do a little set up work here, the camera, we, we don't need to do any background tracking. It's not a moving camera and there's no background to track anyway, so we just shut that down. We could do the solve at this point, but what we're going to do instead is bring in a head mesh that I had set up earlier from a different shot. So I'm just going to work with this for a minute. We're going to 
turn down the opacity a bit for our other display. And I'm going to move over into the camera view or the perspective view. Oops. Let's just move that out of the way a little. For starters, if I could click on that, that would be better. Um, and let's give it a little better color. I want to outline that. So we're going to go to convenient frame in the middle here, and we're going to use a pinning tool and just start dragging this into place. I'm going to hold down control and move these into place. The control just snaps to the nearest vertex on the mesh. Now the two shots here, the, the shot that was used to generate the model and the shot that we're working with were done at different times with different dot placements. So there's no easy correspondence. If you're doing the whole thing in one go, you'd probably want to do that just to make life easier. And we will have it compute some field of view numbers along the way. I'm just lining up that chin line a little bit. So there we have an initial lineup for the mesh and that particular image. So for our next trick, we're going to take all the trackers on the object, that was just a control A, and drop them onto the mesh. And that creates little markers that are literally, you know, 3D positions on the mesh. Whereas before we just had 2D information, now because we had the, the mesh there, we were able to take the 2D locations from the tracker, find that corresponding spot on the mesh, and generate coordinates for the individual trackers. So that's what we've got over here in the lock coordinates of each of these trackers. So by rigging in the mesh and dropping the trackers onto it after it's lined up, we, we generate a whole bunch of coordinates. And, and this is the process, the general process of using a reference model as the basis of a solve. So with that done, we can go and actually we'll, we'll do the solve. And we get, we get something that's reasonable, but not, not altogether great. There's a bunch of rolling shutter in this, not only in the um, in this particular shot, but there's also some rolling shutter in the model itself because I inadvertently used a turntable method of generating that model, which effectively burns in the rolling shutter into the model. So I, I recommend not doing that. That was not a great idea, as I discovered late, later. Um, but we have now the, the mesh is locked up to the object to, to the head and you know later in the shot as, as my mouth opens up there you know the mesh is doing one you know is still doing nothing the, the chin's moving around so now we'd like to do some secondary tracking to be able to animate our mesh to to do the same thing so that's what we're going to set up next so to do that I'm going to go back to our geometric hierarchy tracking room and we're going to go and orbit the camera off to the side. So we're actually going to set up a pivot location for the jaw. So I don't need this anymore. We'll bring up a different toolbar and set up to create a geometric hierarchy object. So I'm going to hold down the shift key, which is used to start that up. And I do that. And again, I orbit around. You'll see it, it's actually placed onto the coordinate system 
of the head that, and the moving object. So, so it stays lined up in the, the coordinate system of the thing that you're moving around. And having got that in place, we can now set up some vertices to get moved around as well. So I'm just going to switch to that surface lasso mode. And now just start lassoing some stuff up. And I'm actually going to want to go and, and double check. One, one thing is that we, we do have a bunch of facets that you know, go fairly much in different directions at the, the bottom side. So we want to make sure that we've got everything. Yeah, that's a better plan. You know, that we get all the facets there. That we don't have some left behind. So we'll do the same thing on the other side. And so that, you know, I'm just adjusting the one axis of our pivot point back there for the jaw, just as a quick little test. So our next trick is actually to be able to generate that automatically as part of the tracking process. So to do that, I'm going to use one of these other trackers here. It's sitting in there. We're done with this guy. Which is tracker 14. So it's sitting right on the chin. I'm just going to drag it down there to be a child of object 2. So that's telling that object that it wants to base what it does on, on that particular tracker. And to, to tell it where to go, I'm going to do the same drop on to mesh that I did before. And again, I have a little tracker coordinate. So what, I, what I'm setting up is a situation that's saying, well, I want the 2D position of this tracker to be driving the animation of the mesh so that that location on the mesh you know, continues to follow along with that 2D position. So I've, I've set that up pretty much. I just need to go and configure the object itself to tell it, well, that I don't want to lock up that axis. I want it to be computed. One other thing is to turn off the, uh, the, the keying so that it knows to go ahead and do the calculation. And just like with regular trackers, when I play through it, that drives the calculation process, tracking and animation of the mesh. So, you know, I went through from that, that location there to the end. Now I go back to the middle and go back to the beginning. So now I have the thing tracked through the entire shot. And you can see how the mesh is uh, animated. Let's just Select our mesh. I think that was more what I had in mind. Not the world's most visible thing. Let's just do that. So we've got now our animated mesh. It's moving around in 3D. It's got some simple animation here on it. So at, at this point, you know, we can animate, we can export the positions of all these objects over the length of the shot. We can also export this mesh animation and, and do that as point cache files, basically, inside of film box files or inside an alembic file. I'll send it along to Blender. But also because we have essentially these, this join angle kind of information, on the individual objects, we can actually export to BVH as well. 
So that's kind of cool. And the same technique of using supervised trackers to drive our animation process is something that works with motion capture files as well. So we can use the geometric hierarchy tracking process to take an animated point cloud that's coming out of a motion capture setup and convert that to join angles that you can then export using the BVH exporter. So, you know, in, in a more realistic and useful example, we'd probably have a better model here with a lot more degrees, you know, a, a lot finer subdivisions to it. And you can paint these things and weight them so that they're smooth blending zones and so on. You can also go and add additional elements to track, you know, the eyebrows, for example. You might do the uh, eyes themselves as well to, to extract the gaze direction of the person as well. And those are, are just additional objects that would be sitting here underneath object one. So not only can you have more of more elements like that, you can also have objects within objects, a whole hierarchy of things, and that gets us back to the pizza box that we started at, where you have multiple levels of objects. So you can have really an entire hierarchy of all objects that are all being tracked so that they maintain the proper relative positioning and still line up with the scene. So it's a very flexible tool. It, it lets you do a whole lot of things in different sorts of situations. You can use different parts of this. You can use the geometric, the geometry tracking. You can use the hierarchy part. You can use the deformation part. You can use it with supervised trackers or not. There, it, there's a big mix, you know, mix and match sort of tool set here to be able to take advantage of for a, a wide variety of creative problem solving applications. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned a lot and get some ideas as to where to look now and what to look at in the manuals and in the tutorials. So have a great day and thanks for watching.